Hello everyone, Lee Henson, President and Founder of Agile Dead, and welcome to today's edition of Daily Stand-Up. Without any further ado, let's get started. Today we're going to cover part two of a two-part series, so if you didn't have an opportunity to listen yesterday to part one, I encourage you to go back and listen to episode 19 first so that episode 20 has a greater impact. Today in episode 20, we're also going to talk about team empowerment, but today we're going to talk about the larger portion of team empowerment. It's called the survivor mentality. Now, I don't know how many of you are TV junkies or reality TV junkies, but I remember when the first season of Survivor came out and how excited and enthralled everyone was to see who would make it to the bitter end and be the the lone survivor on the island, right? One of the things that we all look forward to was the opportunity for anyone who wasn't pulling their weight, for anyone who wasn't necessarily doing their job, for the rest of the group, the rest of the people on the island, all they had to do was at the end of that episode vote that person off the island. You'd often hear the phrase, the tribe has spoken. And, you know, at that point, you're out. You're out like an A-track tape, out like a bad knee, out like a hip replacement. You you were off the island. There was nothing you could do to change it at that point. And it all boiled down to strategy, whether you were eliminating the right person or, you know, how you were playing the game to make sure that you could be the lone survivor left on the island. Now, while this mentality sounds quite unhealthy to be applied in a work environment, I ask you to please... Keep Survivor in the back of your mind as we talk about this this Survivor mentality because I think the mentality that helped them be successful could be the same mentality that helps teams become high-performing. So check this out. Let's explore. So in many organizations where they embrace Agile coaching and they want someone to come in and really help them design or define a way that their organization can be incredibly successful at what they do, so that they can you know, get to that next level of agility, if you will. One of the challenges they often throw to me is that you know, our teams just are constantly changing, or our teams are constantly being shaken up, or you know, things just aren't working well. And my first part of coaching that I explained to them about teams is that the longer you can leave a team cohesive, the more time you can give them to spend together, the better that they are going to do. Um, this is often quoted from Ken Schwaber and from Jeff Sutherland and from others who are founders in the Agile and Scrum community who said, you know, teams should be self-organized. They should be self-disciplined. They should be self-regulated. And I think a lot of times people the people often uh, mistake that for meaning let's line everyone up against the fence and let the team who choose, you know, who's going to be on the initial team. You know, I'll take Frank. I'll take Bob. I'll take Joey. You know, it's not a good old boys club, and that's not what the original mentality was intended to be. I think that we've gone with the pendulum too far one direction, and it's time for us to counter-adjust and come back the other way. So let me explain. The survivor mentality has three key components. The first component is that we need to allow teams to self-organize. So what does that mean? If we're on a team, and we have someone on our team who... Let's just say isn't good a culture it isn't a good cultural fit. It doesn't necessarily mean that you know they're older or younger or that their skill set's different. It's just somebody who doesn't who doesn't gel. They don't have things in common with the team members. They're just maybe maybe they're not contributing in the same way as everyone else is, or maybe they just they do things differently. It doesn't necessarily mean that that person that they're calling out is a bad person. In fact, in many cases, I've switched someone from Team A to Team B only to discover that instantly that person being an addition on Team B made that team a high-performing team. So I think the trick here is when it comes to self-organizations to allow the teams the ability to self-regulate. Now, I'm not saying that that means be discriminatory to anyone based on any standard. What I am saying is that if someone just isn't the perfect cultural fit or if someone's not gelling well with that group chances are if they're a good person they're going to gel well with a different group and it's just a matter of us discovering where that piece fits in a puzzle consider it like a jigsaw puzzle sometimes you know every piece has a fit but sometimes just because it's a dark color doesn't mean it's going to blend well with all the other dark pieces or just because it's shaped a certain way doesn't mean it's going to you know it it has nothing to do with commonalities and trying to create uh homogenous Uh, you know that's not what i'm trying to do What I'm trying to do is help people find the people with correct skill sets that also have similar interests that work well together because it's going to increase the possibility or increase the chance that they're going to become high performing. So a study showed that less than 10% of teams actually make it to high performing as part of the Tuckman model. So the forming, storming, norming, performing, 
less than 10% make it to performing. And the reason why is because either A, the performing teams have the work piled on and they're often not allowed to you know, catch a breath of air and uh, the more they perform and the better they do, the more work gets piled on. Or B, you know, they have a natural enemy and a natural enemy could be in the form of management who says, oh, now I have, you know, eight members of this high performing team. I want to split them up and make eight high performing teams, in which case when you cut the rattlesnake into eight pieces, the rattlesnake is dead. Uh, we don't take that into consideration when we're talking about teams and team mentality. So part one is having that understanding that the team should be empowered to self-regulate. Now, if the team does vote someone off the island, the tribe has spoken, it doesn't mean that person's fired. It just means that that person now has an opportunity to explore with leadership which team they may be a better fit on. And maybe they switch to a different team. And if we find that there's a trend where someone switches from one team to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, there's a good chance that that person may not have been the perfect fit for an organization. And I feel like this is a healthy way for us to gauge to make sure as hiring practitioners that we're bringing on the right people. Part two of this is probably the more, the more difficult part for people on the ground to understand. And this has to do with making sure we get the right people, which is what we just now talked about. I think that oftentimes we have people who are in human resource positions or talent management positions. I hate human resources, uh, the word at least. But talent management positions where they bring in people and they do interviews and they ask specific questions about experience and they ask to have certain certifications. But it's hard to gauge whether that person is just going to be the right person or not. And of course, the, the carrot, the golden incentive, tends to be the money. And one of the things that we find is the people who are on the teams aren't making the money that they could be making if they went and worked elsewhere, so they're constantly exploring options, and that the people who are on the teams are being rewarded every single year regardless of their performance with a small increase uh, to keep them on board because of the pay disparity between what they could be making or should be making and what they are currently making. I think this practice needs to stop. In fact, I encourage organizations to dig a little deeper and try to discover what is it that you know you can do? You know, take this for example. What would happen if you took one of your key performers, compared what they might be making elsewhere, and then brought that person in and said, hey, listen, I noticed that there's a pay disparity here, that if you left and went more for XYZ company, you'd be making 3% more. So officially today, we're going to give you a 3% increase. Now, with that being said, this is the last time that we're going to reward increases or award increases this way. In fact, we're not going to have any more just raises every year like we typically have. In order for you to qualify to get an increase going forward, you need to participate and help your team become high performing. If your entire team becomes high performing, you can participate in a profit share program, which we take the money that would normally be pooled to give those annual increases and put it into one big bucket and divide that bucket amongst those team members who help their teams become high performing. If the team reaches high performance, everyone gets rewarded. If the team doesn't reach high performance, no one gets a reward. This then in turn helps increase accountability. So instead of people sitting here saying, hey, you know, uh, I did this, I did that, and it has no direct relation to what they should be doing at a daily stand-up, for example, you know, people are going to push a little harder and say, well, hold on a second. Yesterday you said you were supposed to be working on these things or you should have been working on these things. You know, what happened? Why didn't you get these things done? You know, do you need some additional training? Do you need some coaching? Is everything okay? Are you having some problems? Is there something you need to talk about? I know it sounds crazy, but you know, it is our responsibility as a coach to make sure the teams have everything they need to be successful. And that includes making sure that they're surrounded by people that they know and trust. And I think third is we need to, you know, in Survivor, failure was never rewarded. And I think we need to embrace failure and say that failure is a good thing, but we don't need to reward failure. You know, experiences happen and we learn from those experiences, and as long as we learn from those experiences, failure is a very positive thing. But we also shouldn't deject people for failure or come down upon them too hard, because the truth is, those are our opportunities to grow and learn and make it too high performing. If someone didn't have a challenge in a TV show Survivor that they lost, those people usually never make it to the bitter end. The people who win every time aren't the people who win the game. The people who lose and feel the smell of defeat are the ones who come back stronger and harder and work harder to make sure that they never feel that way again. So I guess what I'm trying to say is it's important for us to recognize that in order for teams to survive and in order for teams to thrive, well, let's word it this way. In order for a team to thrive, they need to survive. 
And I think that it's it's so critical for us to create an environment where teams feel like they can safely thrive and safely survive because they're trusted and because the work they're doing is being productive. I hope you found this message helpful. And uh, when it comes to team empowerment, know that you can visit Agile Dad. We have tons and tons of information about team empowerment and blogs and our YouTube video channel and the videos posted on the Agile Dad website. Uh, we even have some slide decks about team empowerment and empowering Agile teams. We uh, encourage you to download our uh, podcast episodes, to like what you have here, to leave some valuable comments. And as always, we encourage you to stay healthy, stay well, and stay agile. Until next time, take care.